I don't know. Probably worn out from driving back and forth from Tombstone. That'll teach you to buy a house in Tombstone. Did he really? They bought a house in Yeah, he's been there for a long time. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Why Tombstone? <laughs> Ask him. <laughs> well, if he were here, I would. <laughs> I'm sure you would. He could have gotten called out. Was he on call, too, still? Oh, boy. Well, that's a rough life, that stuff. Well, let's go ahead and pray. I'm so glad to see you all. Saw most of you Christmas Eve. That was fun. Had a good time. And I trust you had a great Christmas, friends and family, and peace and goodwill towards men and all that. Lots of food, yes. Best part. Well, Father, thank you that we can gather together here. We're still in that kind of celebratory Christmas uh, mood, and we thank you for that. Lord, we're here to worship you, to lift up your name, to hear from you, to, to hear what you have to say and to offer up our lives that you might change them, that we might be more and more like you. Thank you that you do do that for us. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And they all said, Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I trust that you're all believers, right? So you all know where you're headed? Okay, just checking. Because I don't have any songs about hell, so I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> haven't listened to country, have you? <laughs> With the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder. When the, roll when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll, when sing it out. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, Yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll do one more time by you with roll. Amen. You're going to hear that shout. Oh, the, the, the trumpet, the, the seventh trumpet will blast. The shout of the archangel, et cetera, et cetera. What are you laughing about? Well, <laughs> well at least they'll have the chords right. Yep. <laughs> he loves me for me, not for my guitar playing. I know. <laughs> that was <just> funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Way to be serious. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now.
Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, come. Now is the time to worship. Come, just be hard before your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before. Uh -huh. One day every tongue will confess you are God One day every knee will bow Still the greatest treasure remains for those Who gladly choose you now uh -huh. Now is the time to worship Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. And the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those. Who gladly choose you now? Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Hallelujah. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love from the top. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healers set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. 
I could sing of your love forever. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Couldn't you? I could sing of you will. Sing of your love forever. While we're ruling and reigning with God in the new heavens and the new earth, which is going to be one huge temple. As a kingdom of priests, we will be worshiping him forever while we're going about whatever it means to rule and reign with him. It's, it's mind-blowing how exciting it's going to be. It's beyond our ability to comprehend. Can't wait. Well, not sort of, you know what I mean. But when he chooses to take each one of us, it's all right, right? Because we know where we're going. Oh, kneel me down again. Here at your poor feet. Show me. How much you love humility Oh, Spirit, be the star That leads me to This humble heart of love I see in you You are the God of the broken The friend of the weak You wash the feet of the weary Embrace the one in me I want to be like you Jesus to have this heart of me you are the God of the humble you are the humble king Oh, kneel me down again Here at your feet Show me how much you love Humility Oh, oh Spirit, be the star that leads me to the humble heart of love. 
I see in you You are the God of the broken The friend of the weak You wash the feet of the weary Embrace the ones in need I want to be like You have this heart in me You are the God of the humble You are the humble King You are the God of the humble You are the humble
the Spirit calls. Come just as you are. Come and see. Come receive. Come and live forever. Spirit call, come just as you are, come and see, come receive, come and live forever. It's a good um, admonition as well as a song. And it fits uh, what's coming next. We have a testimony that Jerry is going to give, and I won't steal any of your thunder, but <laughs> come as you are seems to be appropriate. All right, let's get down here in the heart of the city. <laughs> you guys all know me and know where I've been and know my testimony and my life and all that junk, you know. Uh, I had an opportunity here uh, just a little while ago. Well, I've been sick for 25 days, you know, and... Uh, was it COVID? You know, it very well could have been. I don't know. I was so sick, I wanted to just, I said, God, just take me home. I just, <laughs> I mean, how long are you going to let me suffer? You know, I just, you know, you get, sometimes you get so darn sick, you're at the, seems like you're at the end of your rope. Well, that's where I was, and, you know, uh, when you sometimes when you get in those situations and uh, you know I'm home alone I live by myself and it's like uh, well you know God just takes advantage of you sometimes you know and you know He's got a he, you're captive audience for Him you know and so there was a few things in my life that I just been goofing off just a little bit too much. 
And uh, God, in so many words, said, boy, you need to get it together. You're running astray a little bit too much, and you, you know, you, uh, these things are a hindrance to me. You're not, you're not living right. And uh, so I, be, I, I began to read the Word a lot, and he just started pointing out things in my life that just weren't right and things I was doing. So I just repented, and I said, Lord, here I am. I'm, I'm sorry, and I need to get a little bit better on track again. Well, previously, before I got sick, a friend of mine, an old outlaw biker, got stomach cancer. And uh, so uh, the guy that's responsible for all this stuff on my arms, um, yeah, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, me, yeah. <laughs> he just held my arm while he put the stuff on. <laughs> Said, uh, Joe's got stomach cancer, man. We need to go see him. And so you know, I didn't think much more about it. And so... Uh, I was feeling better and was out the other end of this sickness, and and uh, I got a text from Kevin, and I texted him back, and I said, when can we go see Joe? And he said, uh, I'm in town getting him a prescription right now. I'll swing by and pick you up. So I'm sitting there, and I'm saying, Lord, here I am. What do you want to do? He says, you need to talk to Joe. I said, oh, man, really? <laughs> so we go to Joe's, and we're in the truck, and I say to Kevin, I says, uh, give me five minutes with him alone. And he said, no problem, man. So we get there, and, man, he's, he's in a bad way. And we're talking and stuff, and he's talking about his truck and how the battery is gone in and it's a new truck and they got it on a charger and so I kind of look at Kevin and give him the give him the double O and he gets up with Joe's girlfriend or wife, I don't know what who what she is to him, and uh they go outside. I got this boy's on a vi on identif uh, <laughs> I got him right there where I want him. And I said, Joe, can I talk to you a minute? Well, this guy's a one percenter outlaw biker, which a couple of you people know what that's all about. Some, some don't have a clue, but it's the bad of the baddest in the bike world. And he's a chapter president of the Sons of Odin. So I looked him right in the eye. I said, Joe, can I talk to you a minute? And he says, sure, Moses. That was my bike nickname. And I said, I looked at him right in the eyes, and I said, man, God just give me a, a boldness that I couldn't believe. I wasn't expecting it, you know? I didn't even know if I was going to get an opportunity for sure or not. And he says, what's up, Moses? And I said, I don't know what your beliefs are, Joe. And he was just kind of quiet, and I says, you know what? I don't really care what you believe. I said, I'm, I'm here to give you the greatest gift a man could ever receive. I says, would you be willing to receive something like that? And he says, well, the way you're talking, I suppose I would. So I, we're talking, and I says, you know, a little over 2,000 years ago, this man named Jesus came to earth, hung on a cross and died for your sins, shed his blood, rose on the third day and went to the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back. And he's just kind of, he, you know, he's, I got his attention. And I said, Joe... I said, uh, I'm going to say a prayer with you. And he says, Moses, he says, uh, I, I'm going downhill quick right now. 
he says, I, I really can't talk no more. I'm, I'm feeling bad. And I says, and I took his hand and I said, well, here's how it works, bud. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you mean it in your heart and you want it, squeeze my hand. So I led him in the sinner's prayer and he squeezed my hand. He stood up and he threw his arms around me. And he just started bawling. We both did. He says, I've been asking God for a messenger. He says, my land. I says, will you make it to heaven, Joe? I'm going to see you there. You ain't hell bound no more. And that was it. I've been high since that day. <laughs> Good morning. The topic of my sermon this morning is, are you married or just dating the church? Louder. Louder. Turn me up. All right. I thought this morning that the worship team did an excellent job, and there's one song that really got to me, and that's, come now is the time to worship. Come now is the time to give your heart. Come just as you are to worship. Come just as you are before your God. Couldn't have said it better any other way, is there? Anyways, there was three boys in the schoolyard, and they were bragging about their fathers. The first boy says, my father scribbles down a few words on a piece of paper, and he calls it a poem, and they give him $50. The second boy said, that's nothing. My father scribbles words down on a piece of paper, and he calls it a song. They give him $100. The third boy says, I got you both beat. My father scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, and he calls it a sermon. It takes eight guys to bring the money in. <laughs> Today's text is from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 32. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word, so that he may present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. There are two pictures that make sense to us, two analogies that are obvious in this passage. When we read them, we can see and feel what they mean. Both of them bring home to us the importance of being personally committed to a gathering like this. As I was growing up in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and that's a town of about 23,000 people, so there's not a lot there, my older brother was well-known and he had a lot of recognition for being a well-known athlete in our high school. I didn't play football or basketball or track and field because I was too short and too slow. But I was a bit jealous of my brother. My first year in high school, they began a program in wrestling. And I said, I was very interested in joining and I signed up. And we had a coach that explained 
that he didn't know too much about wrestling. Let me tell you, he was a little all-American fullback playing football. And he was a little all-American, like I said. And he said that uh, he had to take the job because the school had no one in mind. But he would make sure that we would never tire out during a match. Then he mentioned something that really caught my attention. If we wanted to be successful, we would have to marry into our sport. Now, I asked him, how do I marry my sport? And he said that I needed to be totally committed, read books, any books I could get on wrestling, and he had a few. I need to study films, and I need to go down and watch our college team, our local college team, uh, during wrestling matches. And so I committed to do just that. I practiced every day, about an uh, hour and a half, two hours. I don't know if any of you have been in an auditorium where the steps are like this out in the corner. We had to run up them steps and across and down them steps and up them steps. And I thought I was going to die. But that's how he got us in shape. And after practice, I used to run about a mile, mile and a half to the college, and I asked the coach if I could practice with him, and he said, do you promise to come to my college? I said, I'll try. So he let me practice with them. And on the weekends, I practiced with some college state champions. They had a couple of them. And, and I practiced real hard learning special moves that they taught me. And at the end of my first season wrestling, I became the first state champion in our school. It was an individual sport, so I felt like I was a little bit better than my brother. He had all these guys helping him. So anyways, after that, I learned that I married myself to the Army, and I married myself to church. I want to talk to you this morning about marriage. The marriage I have in mind is not my marriage or your marriage, nor is it the institution of marriage, which seems to be moving in a dishonorable and God-ignoring directions at every turn in our country. No, this morning I want to talk to you about Christ's love for his bride, the church. I want to speak to you about his devotion and sacrifice for what is, for him, the unrivaled passion of his heart. And I want to argue that if church means this much to Jesus, it ought to mean that much more to you and me. In fact, I want to pick up on this analogy that Paul uses of Christ's love for the church and ask you a very important question this morning. Are you married or dating the church? Now, there's a difference of the two. It's obvious. Dating is a kind of a trial period in a relationship where your commitments are soft. <laughs> you might want to hide. Relationships are tentative, and you keep your options open. Marriage is a covenant relationship of devotion, sacrifice, joy. In marriage, you have burned your ships. There's no turning back, and you only have eyes for the one to whom came forward to pledge to you. So I ask you again, are you married to the church? fully devoted, making sacrificial investments of money, of time, money, and energy? Or are you dating the church, nominally involved, partially invested, maintaining enough detachment so that if it doesn't work out the way you want, you can hit the door without any lingering obligations? How you answer that question will determine whether you have nailed down this last truth of six truths in your trauma toolbox. I'm sure you all have a trauma toolbox, right? <laughs> we want to be certain that we are already, that we already have vital truths in place before the bottom drops out from under your feet. Truths worth believing like, number one, the Lord is God. Number two, the Bible is God's word to me. Number three, 
I am a sinner who needs a savior. Number four, God has sent his son Jesus to be that savior. Number five, salvation is a gift you receive, not a paycheck you earn. And number six, and very important that you need to nail down, and your life is a personal commitment to a local church. Maybe it sounds a little self-serving for me to include this in a list titled Six Vital Life-Saving Things You Will Want in Place Before a Crisis Comes. I'm here saying that it is vital to have a strong, growing relationship with the people of God, where you can encourage each other in Christ and pray for one another and bear each other's burdens and intervene when you see a brother or sister lapsing into sinful patterns. Is it any of my business to urge you to belong and be personally invested in a local church for your own sake? Statistically, one out of four church attendees are considered church shoppers. It's kind of like Kmart shoppers. With no real devotion to any particular local church. An estimated 15 to 20 million. I want to say that again. An estimated 15 to 20 million Americans have said they are Christians, but they don't want to be part of a church. Around 80% of American evangelical churches are plateaued and declining. When asked, people give the standard answers. Church is irrelevant. It's boring, hypocritical, and after my money. My first point is the church is the bride of Jesus. The whole context of this passage about marriage has this model of Christ's passion for his bride, the church, as its foundation. And the point is powerful. Jesus wholeheartedly, unconditionally loves his church. You know, there's a moment in every wedding when the bride comes down the aisle, walks down the aisle to her groom, and everybody rises to their feet as the music plays and all eyes are on the bride. Tell you what I like to do. I like to look at the groom. <laughs> I take a quick look at the groom's face. If he's grinning from ear to ear in anticipation, wistful, unspeakably happy, lost in love for the one who is coming to pledge herself to him, it's just wonderful. Now listen, if you can see that look in the groom's face, then you have a small understanding of the intensity of Christ's love for his church. It resonates through this passage. What stands out here, writes John Stott, is the sacrificial steadfastness of the heavenly bridegroom's covenant love for his bride. What makes this passage even more striking for me is that I get to be part of this church. Amen. The church in the Bible is made up of those who have been called out by the Spirit of Christ to salvation. The church is God's people. It's you and me and every believer in every place around the world who has put their trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. The truth is, when you read the, that Christ loved the church and he gave himself for her, you might as well be reading, Jesus loves me like that. It becomes intensely personal to study the words, Christ loved the church, and when I see that I am included among those he loves. And it strikes me when I see the Greek word for love that Paul uses here. It immediately takes me to the cross. It is the word agape, which refers to the absolute, unself-centered sacrifice of Christ for my sake. His love for me never quits, never wavers, 
never weakens. Amen? When we take of the bread and the cup of juice to remember his broken body and the shedding of his blood, it is a measure of how far he will go for you and me. His holy love for the church moved him with purpose to make her holy, cleansing her, cleansing her in the washing of water by the word. I am thrilled to see my complete forgiveness in those words, my justification accomplished at his word, and gentle, patient work of making me holy like himself. Christ is totally committed to the church. He is totally committed to me and you. Can I love like that from him as an imperfect person? He is sanctifying while ignoring the rest of what his love has purchased. You know that I found in my life the more Christ I become, the more like Christ I become, the more I love what he does. And, devotes my, and I devote myself to make, move, make what moves him to action. Say what you want to say, but you know it's true. If you're going to be like Jesus, you won't date the church anymore. And you won't stumble over the imperfections that are going to happen when a group of imperfect people gather together. You'll just realize it has flaws. That's what Jesus died for. I'll take a break here now and we'll finish next Sunday. Oh, no, just kidding. (laughs) The church is the body of Christ. In verse 25, the church is the wife of Jesus Christ. But in verse 30, the church is called the body of Christ. We are members of his body. It says, Paul changes the imagery to emphasize some important thing. The image of the bride tells us deep things about the devotion and love of Christ Jesus. For us, his bride. The image of the body of Christ reminds us that we have an assignment to fulfill. When Jesus bodily walked this earth. He moved from place to place in a small geographical area, doing the will of the Heavenly Father and securing the salvation of everyone who believes. Now, having ascended back to heaven, he still moves from place to place. Only now it's on a global scale. How does he do that? Through us. We are his body. Ephesians 1.22 says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be over everything for the church. Ephesians 1.2 expands on this picture when it explains by telling us that God the Father has put everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of one who fills all things in every way, like the fingers and the toes. We just have those so we can count to 20, right? Like his eyes and elbows of your physical body, you are part of of Christ's body on earth, which is the church. And just like various parts of your physical body have a specific function in relation to the body, so you have a specific function in God's body, Christ's body. There is no unimportant member of the church. Each of us has a function to fulfill for the good of the whole body. Ephesians 14, 6 speaks about the body being built up in love as each part is working properly. Ephesians 4, 16. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 15 through 18. 
Now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. And it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? In fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them. Run with me this on this, okay? Let's say for the sake of this illustration, when God saved you, he made you a hand in his body. You have the gift of service that is meant to minister to the rest of the body by assisting, fixing, and working. You are, an, you are the oil in the machinery that keeps things running smoothly. So what happens when you say, I love you, Jesus, but I don't want to be part of your church? That's like saying, Jesus, I love you, but I don't want to be part of your body. So I'm cutting off your hand from your body. But what I'm really saying is, okay, how would that work for your physical body if your parts did a little mutiny? As your big toe, let me just say that I'm sick and tired of working with all these other toes. They're all a bunch of posers. I do most of the work and they still get treated as my equal. So I think I'm just gonna take a break. You don't really need me anyway. You get the point? If you're a Christian, you have an assignment to fulfill in the body of Christ. He's on the move and needs every member of his body in on what he's doing. So when you're missing an action, half-hearted, hearted, casually committed, the rest of the body is crippled and weakened. Conclusion. Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 calls us to a different value system when it comes to the church. Verses 24, 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more you see the day approaching. For this church to be all God wants it to be, needs to be working properly, needs to be connected, needs to be participating, sharing the burdens and the joys together. Most of you are part of that body, are, as part of that body are living examples of this message. I cannot thank you enough for your example your partnership, and your stewardship of life for his sake. But I also urge you who are on the margins, who are going through the motions, who are acting out of habit rather than commitment, to ask yourself this question. Am I married or just dating the church? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and thank you for giving me this message to pass out. And Lord, it's that time that the world's looking pretty dim. Things are falling around all of us. Just strengthen each and every one of us. Those that need help, please be with them, Lord. We need to let our lights shine more than ever. And we ask this in your name, Lord. Amen.